Nature of Society Part 2 Session 4R. This evening we are going to establish illustratively what share of the wealth produced goes to the controller of land and what share of wealth produced goes to the controller of labor. This we have defined in previous sessions, rent and wages respectively. One who controls the land is a landowner, one who works a laborer, one who controls capital is a capitalist. These three functionaries may be one person, as in the case of a small landholder, but in large enterprises, these three are often different persons. These are three distinct functionaries, and one must get this in mind. Our purpose here is not to determine how much wealth is received, but we are acting here as analysts in trying to determine and ascertain by what powers they are enabled to obtain their wealth. So please also keep this in mind. The principal claimants to wealth produced are then the landowner, the laborer, and the capitalist. There are other secondary claimants, such as the providers of some raw materials that go into the operation or the tax authorities. These can have an impact on the viability of the enterprise if they are excessive, but we will treat with these possible impacts in another session. The discussion this evening does not relate to rent and wages derived from any particular industry, but with the general level throughout society. If the share taken by the landowner in rent increases, the wages received by the laborer will reduce commensurately. commensurately. Rent, as we saw in part one, only arises when a community exists. With a community of one, there is no rent. Even with a community of two, three, four or five, there is no rent. Rent only arises when the best lands are occupied and others come along, they must settle for inferior or less productive land. Now this phenomenon has nothing to do with any natural abilities the first comers had. It simply has to do with the fact that these first comers occupied the best lands. If equal skill and effort is applied to the best land and to the inferior land, the product or yield would be greater on the best land simply because it is the best land. Do we understand this? Are there any questions or comments here? So as the community grows, so as to absorb all the best land available and begin to spread on the inferior land, a proportion of the wealth produced on the better land becomes rent. The poorer the land into which the community spreads, the greater the proportion of wealth produced on the better land will be rent, as a, and as a result, the smaller the proportion taken in wages. This does not mean that the amount of wealth going to the laborer would necessarily be reduced. It is a fact that as a uh, that it is a fact that as community grows, the amount of wealth produced per head of the population on the best land and the poorest land increases substantially. So we have the schematic depiction of this first the first arrivals where all the land, best lands are occupied, no rent. Notwithstanding this, there is an increasing disparity in the share of wealth taken as rent and share of wealth taken as wages. This relationship between rent and wages is a dynamic one. As the community grows, rent as a share of wealth grows, and wages decrease as a share of wealth. This can be depicted by the following line diagrams. So the group of, we have this schematic of the group A, the group of first arrivals, Group B, second arrivals. Group C, third arrivals. 
So groups B and C occupy inferior lands. And the wages are the wage levels are established on what is earned on the, the least uh, productive lands. In this case it's 80. In our diagram, as the first arrivers come and establish themselves, they all have access to the best lands. No one has an advantage over the other. As the second group of arrivers come, they set, up, they set up on the next best available lands. And as these lands are inferior to the first groups, immediately the phenomenon of rent arises as the yield of the first group exceeds that of the second. As group C arrives, group B's product now has a rental value over C as well as group A over C. The assumption, it must be repeated, is that each group is applying equal skill and effort on their tracts of land. The use of numbers would help to illustrate the point very clearly. Let the product or yield of each number of groups A be 100, the product or yield of each num number of group B be 90, and the product or, or yield of each number of group C be 80. With equal skill and effort applied throughout, the phenomenon of rent arises with group A over group B being 10 in the first instance and group B over group C of also 10. Group A would have a rental value of 20 over group C. Group C would have, a no, would have no rental value now, but when a group D arrives, then the new rental values would in inevitably affect all groups. How are wages determined? Suppose a member of group C wishes to, to no longer work on inferior land, but wishes to work on the best land. If he first wishes to be first employed, the landlord in the group would of course ask him what wage he would be willing to work for. Then group C worker would certainly say at least 80 because this is the wage that he can earn on the most inferior land. The group A landlord will not likely recruit him if he offers them less than that amount. If the group C worker wishes to lease the land from group A, from the group A landowner, the landowner will not accept anything less than 20, because this is the amount he can earn in addition to his wage of 80. Similarly, transactions are likely if group C individual approaches a group B landowner. Thus, it is that the share of wealth that goes in rent on the one land, on the, on the one hand, and in wages on the other, is determined by the amount of wealth that labor may produce upon the best land open to use free of charge. As population increases and population extends to the inferior lands, the proportion of wealth going to in rent and the better land will increase, and consequently the proportion of wages will decrease. In our discussion thus far, we are assuming that in our settler situation, all land is freely available. We want to introduce here the concept of the margin of production. The margin of production is the best land to be had for free. The group C landowner in our example occupies the margin of production. This may not necessarily be barren or infantile soil. It is simply the best land to be had for nothing. Rent in summary then is determined by the difference between the product of labor on any piece of land over and above what the same labor and capital would produce at the margin of production. This is in the context of where land is freely available. When we return after the break, we will consider the situation where land is not freely available. <laughs>
as in our current situation in society. In the current situation of most societies, land is not freely available. Land is fully enclosed either by private individuals or the state. When, is, when this is the case, the situation is wholly different as regards the relationship between rent and wages. Here's a line diagram that it depicts this. So we have this schematic of lands all enclosed and some held out of production as we are all familiar with in our own communities. So we have a column, the columns represent production profiles and, and in between these production profiles are no production taking place. These lands are all enclosed, held out of production. When for whatever reason lands are held out of production or are unproductive, then this situation must bring about unemployment and the denial of men to have their needs satisfied through work on land. In this scenario, the unemployed will necessarily have to approach those productive sites for employment. What these site owners will invariably do is to ask those seeking an unemployed, those seeking employment, how much are you willing to work for? This places those seeking employment at, at a disadvantage where they will only work for the least amount, instinct, instinctively writing down the value of their labor. This wage value will turn out to be much lower than if the land is not enclosed. Rent will be determined by the difference between the amount of wealth produced on the land in question and the least which laborers, laborers will accept in wages. It is important to recognize the different conditions that will prevail when land is freely available, when it is not. When land is freely available, wages are higher throughout the society. The standard of living is higher, and the laborer has the ability to own his own capital rather than having to borrow it. Productivity as a consequence is much higher. In this, in this scenario where land is enclosed, standards of living are low, wages are low, and the ability of the laborer to own or borrow capital is minimal. Productivity, consequently, is low. In periods of economic boom, all men can find employment easily. The competition for work will ease, and wages will rise. But when the economy recedes, Men who have nothing but their labor are dependent on employment with others for his very existence. And as all lands are enclosed, wages will be necessarily lower as competition increases. Capital. A special and pecuniary situation exists where land is all enclosed as it relates to capital. As we said, Wages in this condition are low, and the ability of men to provide their own capital to produce wealth with greater efficiency is minimal. In this scenario, the entrepreneur, usually a landowner, arises in this society who has the ability to provide the modern tools and equipment to produce the wealth with greater efficiency. Labor will tend to seek employment with this enterprise, as the tools provided here are much more desirable than the rudimentary tools that the laborer can provide for himself, where he will he self-employed. This ability to provide modern tools for production of wealth is the reason for the arrival of the conglomerate business and the attraction of the laborer to it. This is a situation where all land is enclosed.
Their land is freely available, wages as a consequence are higher, and the need to borrow to provide one with capital for production is much lower. Much lower. A whole band of entrepreneurs will arise naturally and not from the need to find employment where modern tools and equipment exist. If the conglomerate arises, it will only be due to the desire for small entrepreneurs coming together to cooperate. The terms and conditions of this cooperation will be wholly different than if the land was all enclosed. Wages. Wages will vary between different types of work. Those whose vocation require more expensive training and greater skill will invariably obtain a higher wage, for otherwise it would not be worth a man's time and effort to undergo such training or acquire such a skill. Generally though, where land is freely available, wages will be high throughout and wealth will be more will be more evenly distributed as a result of all men given an, given an equal chance to produce. The man who is more skillful will produce more wealth, and it is only natural that he should obtain more, but it would not mean that he obtains a greater share of the total produced. Where land is all enclosed, he will be subject to competition. As many as with any other man and will obtain no more than other equally skilled men will be willing to accept. The landowner and the entrepreneur will however be the recipient of the lion's share of the wealth produced. Before we end, I would like again to let you attendees know that unsustainable development is an educational offering devoted to the dissemination of its course to all of mankind and to those who have the English language as the official language in the first instance and to all eventually all over the world. To make this possible and because we do not charge a fee for this dissemination, we rely wholeheartedly on monetary donations to meet the cost of achieving these goals. If you have found these sessions useful thus far and would like others to have access to them, we would gratefully accept your donations should you be inclined to offer them. You can send donations to our PayPal account at the email address nigelgittins at gmail.com. Thank you for your kind gesture.